Lori, can you please let me know if I'm audible? Uh, yes, Anal, you are audible. Let's wait for two more minutes and then we can start. Okay. Hello. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to the sixth memorial lecture of Dr. ML Srikant. Yesterday was the 86th birth anniversary of our former dean, Dr. Manesh L. Srikant. He was the honorary dean for this institute for 28 years. We all have heard his voice in the prayers that we say together at the start of every academic program. He gave us two pillars on which we see our institute today, influencing practice and promoting value-based growth. Dr. Shikan's contribution is etched in the minds and hearts of all the members of SBJMR family. We want to do our bit to honor his memory on this occasion. This memorial lecture will enable us to preserve his memory and carry his legacy forward. Before we begin with the lecture, I'd like to request Professor Malakrishna to share a few words about Dr. M. L. Shrikant. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm truly honored and grateful for this opportunity to share some thoughts on Dr. M. L. Srikant, the former Dean of this Institute. He was our honorary Dean and was a true pioneer in management education in India. And before that, very accomplished. Uh, he was the founding partner of a very different kind of management consultancy. Uh, he was the CEO of an iron and steel company and in recently independent India, his career as an engineer was also remarkable. But uh, you know, I'm gonna limit myself today to talk very briefly about the time that I knew him between 2010 and 2015, and specifically one quality of his that stood out for me, that inspired me, which was his intense curiosity. So I'll illustrate. 
I was a, a new faculty member uh, just a couple of months into the job. When I get a call asking me to meet him, suddenly out of the blue, I uh, get up and walk to his office. He offers me a seat and then shares this book he's reading uh, is about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So, uh, you know, I'm taken aback a bit. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is to do with quantum physics, uh, basically the precision of measuring or the limits to precision of measuring subatomic or quantum phenomena. So I'm uh, taken aback and then he goes on to say that, look at this mathematical inequality in this book. Uh, I think we could connect it to administrative theory. I walk out of the room and by the way, he gives me an assignment, come back in a couple of days, let me know what you think. So I walk out in, in a little bit of shock and I'm thinking back and I'm, I'm trying to say, this is, this is the dean of the number one business school in Mumbai, top ranked school, excellent faculty, uh, very robust and stable curriculum. Why is he doing such radically experimentative things with the curriculum? And uh, I think I got the answer after observing him for the next several months, he was driven by curiosity. Uh, one of the things that drove him. There were many such examples and very briefly, whenever the library would organize a book exhibition, I would find him there. Uh, when a faculty member would walk into a small group meeting with a couple of books, he would ask about those. Uh, his curiosity would be aroused. He was also curious about people, about participants, about employees of SPGMR, about many people he would meet. Uh, and why? Why cultivate such an intense and wide ranging curiosity? One benefit of this curiosity I found was that it fueled innovation and deep experimentation. So this curiosity was not of the armchair variety. Ah, interesting. Uh, to give you an example, we still uh, uh, are, we, we have in our part of our, two of our programs, this idea of international immersion uh, uh, or 3B global fast track program. I remember that through his leadership, we tried three different models and uh, collected data, collected evidence, what works, what doesn't work, financial data, satisfaction of the participants, uh, faculty feedback, and so on and so forth, and analyzing, and then finally settling on one and then refining it all the time. So I say we settled on this, this idea because he really encouraged this curiosity in everyone he met. Uh, active, evidence-based curiosity. Sometimes he allowed others to experiment even when he knew that the experiment was unlikely to, unlikely to succeed. Why? Because I think he wanted others to learn from taking risks, uh, to fail and learn from that failure and try again, try something different. Uh, he did not limit this curiosity to, uh, to, to just institute, uh, he also, uh, experimented and uh, thought deeply and was curious about the workings of the human mind, about philosophy, spirituality. And again, he was humble enough to ask you, ask me what I might have to add to this, uh, to this curiosity. So I think this curiosity of Dr. M. Shrikant rubbed off in good measure on me and I'm sure on other employees. And my sincere hope is that our participants in across programs will cultivate this too. I would uh, therefore especially encourage our participants here today to not restrict this learning experimentation and curiosity to your time at SPJMR. Please do find a way to nurture it in your careers and uh, even deep into your life. Thank you, I'll turn it back to our compare. Thank you, sir, for sharing a wonderful exposition of the vision that led Dr. Shrikant to set up the Institute and his journey of many trials and tribulations to bring the Institute to where it is today. To talk about Dr. Shrikant, he was a pioneer in Indian management education who always emphasized on the need for dynamic education system that focuses on individual growth. Today, we witness students, parents, and educators often complain about the current education system examinations and admissions from kindergarten to universities and research institutes seem to be the biggest burden for people. The entire education system is designed to filter students at each stage, creating barriers and gatekeepers. But technology, on the other hand, enables 
open access to knowledge. The need is to create accessible and affordable education and derive new rules, processes, and institutions that support and encourage such education. To address these thought-provoking and intriguing ideas, we have with us our honorable guest, Dr. Madhav Chavan amongst us. After obtaining a PhD in chemistry from the Ohio State University and serving as a faculty member at the University of Houston, Dr. Madhav Chavan returned to India. In the context of chemistry, he was coded to be a catalyst for education. Inspired by the national literacy mission launched by Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, the then Prime Minister of India, Dr. Madhav Chavan worked in the adult literacy sector from 1989 to 1994. In 1994, UNICEF put him in charge of creating a societal mission to universalize primary education in the city of Mumbai. As a result, he co-founded Pratham in Mumbai, which has now grown to be one of the India's largest NGOs working across the country with millions of children every year, focusing on basic learning outcomes, including lead, reading and math. Pratham has been recognized internationally by prominent organizations with prestigious awards for both quality of innovation and their extensive impact. As the co-founder of Pratham, Dr. Madhav Chavan made it to made it his mission to bring low cost quality learning to underprivileged children across India. Named a 2014 Asia Game Changer by the Asia Society, Dr. Chavan also received the 2012 Vice Prize instituted by the Qatar Foundation at the World Innovation Summit for Education. It is truly an honor to have him here with us today as our esteemed guest. The topic for today's lecture is, what should a new education system be like? I'd like to invite Dr. Madhav Chavan to kindly deliver the memorial lecture. Sir, you're on mute. How did that happen? Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this uh, guest talk, I would say. Uh, I must start by talking about Dr. Shrikant. Uh, I was introduced to Manesh Bhai as I knew him by my father, who was his uh, rival and very close friend. When Manesh Bhai was the CEO of uh, uh, Mukan Lion and Steel, my father was a union leader. Now you can imagine the relationship between the CEO and the union leader, but yet I was really surprised as to how close they could be. Manesh Bhai was very uh, happy to share some of his personal problems even with my father. And uh, I was witness to some meetings of theirs and it, it really astonished me that two people could be so close in spite of being rivals. Uh, then the other point of admiration that I have for Manish Bhai, among other things, is the fact that he set up SP Jain Institute outside the university system and challenging the monopoly of the Mumbai University to create a, a course and a degree for management. Now that was completely new when SP Jain Institute was set up. Nobody dared to go out completely and say, because there's a question mark. If you set up an institution, which is not recognized by the university system, will it be recognized by uh, businesses? And yet SP Jain Institute was set up. It created its own brand, its own value. And that was an example for many others to set up their own institutions. And this is important. And this one point is close to what I'm going to talk about today. You see, when I started working in the field of primary education uh, 27, 28 years ago, we were talking about every child in school and learning well. Uh, the problem at that time that was seen globally and also in India is that very large numbers of children for not entering schools. Um, they were, give me a second. Um, they were, even if, uh, even those who entered the school system, 
dropped out way before they completed their high school. Sometimes at fifth standard, sometimes at eighth standard. And, uh, and the quality of education people complained about, but did not really know what it meant to say that children are getting poor education. The quality of education in India is poor. In 2005, we uh, launched what we call the annual status of education report. Across India, we measured in very simple terms uh, what turned out to be a measure of quality of education at the primary level. Fifth standard children, and I, I suppose many of you know about this annual status of education report. We call it ASER, ASER for impact of the government school uh, system or private school system for that matter. And um, the, the, the uh, impact of government spending on education. The end result of this survey, which has been going on for the last 15 years, 16 years, is that we know now, even today, that in standard five, more than 50% children can barely read uh, a first or second standard simple text and paragraph. Which means now uh, that these children who cannot read simple basic text will not be able to complete their education. Even if they complete their education, it will be meaningless. The situation since that time has changed dramatically. In those days, now 94, there was no measure of how many children were entering schools. There was people who were talking about large numbers of children not being in school. But no reliable statistics as to how many children actually entered the school stream. But it was largely known that the education system was a pyramid. Very large numbers of children entering school, but uh, by the time they reached 10th standard, the numbers were very small and even smaller as they went higher. Um, this situation over the last 20 years has changed dramatically. At least we have measured it uh, since uh, uh, 2005. The enrollment in schools at the first standard across India, we say now, is close to 97, 98%. So to say that large numbers of children are not going to school is not true anymore. This 98% almost goes vertically without any dropping out till fifth standard. Some dropping out starts at fifth standard and then uh, it continues. By the time you are in the age of uh, age bracket of uh, 16, 17 years, we see that 85% kids or youth are enrolled in some educational stream or the other, 85, 86%, mind you. This is India. When we started out, it was imagined that this number must be very small uh, and, and we measured it. Uh, in 2005, 2006, that number used to be much smaller than what it is today, 85, 86%. Now, what does that mean? That means a large number of children and youth are staying in the education stream for a long period of time. But uh, while this is happening, it is important to know that the measure of the quality of education that we use uh, at fifth standard, only about 50% children are able to read a simple stand, standard two text still remains. That has not changed over the years since 2005. It's remained stationary. This is really shocking. And we've advocated, we've tried, uh, we've launched campaigns, we've talked to governments, it doesn't matter what party, and yet this has not changed. And now the, the national education policy that has been launched uh, in 2020, implemented since last year, it seems, uh, is actually focusing on this fact that children can't read or do, be do basic arithmetic. And if that problem is not solved, says the national education policy, then progress and everything that we want to do is going to be go uh, going to waste. Now, this is uh, the first time that government has accepted that there is a problem and said something has to be done about it. 
and the, and and in the uh, or I, I hope that things will change and in the next four or five years but 2026 is a time uh, the milestone that the government has declared that by 2026 all children reaching third standard should be able to read fluently and literacy, foundational literacy and literacy uh, mission has been launched now I'll, I'll i'll change gears here so what it means is that if by fifth standard if the basics foundations of learning are imbibed absorbed by by the young children then they will be able to learn higher and much better now let me make a statement and spend a lot uh, some bit of the time i've already spent 15 minutes talking about this basic problem of foundational literacy which ma makes it very difficult for kids or 100 percent children to complete their education or get any basic quality education now let me ask you and i'm sorry we are not in a classroom i if this pandemic wasn't there we would have been a in an auditorium i could have asked you live questions uh, if i say education helps me as an individual education helps me to improve my life i suppose that is a fair statement to make is it a fair statement to make yes i think the uh, experience around us shows us that People who are educated by and large uh, will improve their life. But there is a problem these days. It seems that graduates, the, the rate of unemployment among graduates is higher than rate of unemployment among uh, people who are not highly educated. And this is because there are more manual work jobs than jobs for managers, accountants, and so on and so forth. Um, you can check this out. This is a statistic from China and India. I suppose uh, your management institute uh, has these numbers. And if, but this is this is said that if you are highly educated, the chances that you will get employment are low. But anyway, that's a digression. Education helps me improve my life. Helps an individual improve his life is true. Not, not, not untrue. Uh, in spite of the statistic that I'm saying, it it is true. <coughs> Excuse me. But what about changing this statement to education helps us as a community, as a society, to improve our lives? Now that's different from an individual saying education helps me improve my life. Everybody together, uh, you know, I get distracted when people write in chats when I'm talking. Now, I don't know what to do about it. Is there something we can be okay, that can be done? I know people will write in chats. I get distracted. Anyway, um, as I was saying, uh, as a community improving our lives and as an individual improving my life, these two things are... Uh, sometimes in conflict individually i'm trying to do like everybody now today this morning i was reading the indian express and there's a article uh, advertisement really about the how a competitive the environment and how education has to improve and in a competitive environment you learn there's nothing wrong about it but competition is for what a competition is for jobs yes so individuals are learning and trying to improve their quality of learning to get better jobs. True. And if all people improve their learning, uh, what will happen? If there is, there is a limited number of jobs, then is everybody is competing for the jobs. Uh, every, everybody will have higher education. But if the job, number of jobs don't improve, they increase, then we'll have very highly educated people who won't get jobs. And now there is something interesting happening in the world, and I suppose the younger generation is aware of it, and so must be the 
faculty of management institutions it is said that more and more repetitive jobs will be taken up by machines i remember when i was a kid my mother used to send me to the bank to get uh, cash <laughs> there were no atms in fact when i remember suddenly in the bank uh, a window opened that says teller and i didn't know what a teller was and now we have uh, the teller machines so in those days to get cash we had to go and write up a, a slip or a check and hand it over then they matched our signatures and all that and then from one window to another window the register went for, the register went from one place to another and then finally we got some cash whether it was 5 rupees or 50 or 500 the process was the same and today i walk into an atm and i do the, the jobs of all those people were gone those descriptions are gone but that doesn't mean the jobs have reduced jobs have also increased because of the way the economy has grown but in the longer run it is predicted by many people of a higher order saying that now the robots are going to take up a lot of the jobs lot of our production is automated already and it's going to get more and more automated as a result there will be fewer jobs and as today as of today in india in india i think and I, again i would request you to verify the number first of all we have 140 uh, crore population out of which 35 40 crores are in the non working age group either older or younger you have 100 crores that are in the working population who should be in the uh, productive population and who should be making out the workforce but actually 50% of these form the workforce of india 50 crores 50% are not in the workforce according to i think the information that is given out by the government out of the 50 crores who make the working population only about 9% 9% have salaried jobs now all the young people who are going into schools are told if you learn well if you get good scores if you do this you go to a higher education institution of repute and all of that then you're going to get a better job but everybody is competing for that 9% and that 9% is not going to increase salary salary jobs i'm not saying people don't have work of course the 50% people are working and the other 50% are not counted as productive workers we are housewives who are contributing so much to the economy their labor is not counted they are not counted in the labor force of india uh, so I, i i won't go into that but the 50% out of the 50% who are counted as workforce only about 9% are going to go for salary jobs others are self employed uh, entrepreneurs and so on and so forth who may be earning more or less living with uncertainties and so on and so forth so if this is the case if i say i am getting educated for jobs then there is a fallacy there i mean ultimately so many percent of the uh, population will not get jobs and that number i suspect uh, in relative terms is going to go on shrinking they may get jobs but they were they are only either you are going to get very high uh technical skills jobs or repetitive jobs or just working with the machines and so on and so forth so as we go forward and and in 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 the audience are young people in their 20s who will have who have another 30 40 years ahead of them before they can give talks like <laughs> like some of us old people um uh, what kind of employment scenario or life scenario is possible in india in, in your surroundings in the next 25 30 years 25 years from now what will it look like that is what we have to prepare for isn't it and not just for tomorrow tomorrow i'll i'll go apply get a job not get a job or something but the society as a whole how is it going to change is a question that one has to ponder and marvel at um very interesting thought process you can you can play a game with uh, people and say 
how are things going to happen and what that points to is what, like what we saw during the pandemic so many people falling sick old people falling sick young people falling sick and to be cared for and not enough institutions hospitals we look at product production there is a lot that could be done and in our education system i was surprised i don't know again a, a number that you can check up uh, the proportion of um, people who are going for agricultural engineering whatever that is is 10 times less agricultural engineering in a country where 50 percent of the working population is engaged in agriculture even the non-working population 50 percent we depend on agriculture in that people working uh, studying agricultural engineering is 10 times less than those studying for aeronautical engineering can you believe that i didn't believe that i looked at the numbers i i could be wrong but please check it out and these numbers are available as common uh, indicators of education and so on so so there are going to be fewer jobs but education and skills are required very interesting there is a there is a gentleman called kai fu li uh, i'm sure some of you know him or know of him and i came across some of his articles and so on he made a very interesting uh, statement in one of his documents and what he says is look before the 18th century working for an owner of a production machine or a factory the concept was unknown people were either working on their own farms or they were serfs or peasants and working for a landlord and the relationship was just rent or, or paying something or the other but then after 18th uh, the 18th century the concept of a factory concept of a different workplace came in and then now we are coming to a point where you are being told that if you work for a good company then you are somebody then on shadi.com you uh, matter in the marketplace of marriages as they are in india it depends you know, which company are you working for of course there is there is an open market also out there but i suppose people are asking each other who do you work for where do, oh you work for such and such company i don't want to name names oh very good uh, you got a degree oh you got a degree great so the labels have become important to say who you are and where you work is the thing that gives you a position or recognition. I keep giving some examples. Uh, and my favorite example is Gulzar, the lyricist. Uh, I suppose you know that Gulzar, or some of you at least should know because WhatsApp travels very quickly these days. Gulzar Saab used to work in a uh, automotive mechanic shop. Not that he was actually fixing cars, maybe he was. He used to be a mechanic, or at least he works worked in a mechanic shop. Was that in, as they say in Hindi, kya unki ye pehchan thi, ki wo mechanic hai? Tab wo aise, that, that time it was, it was said that he, he must be working in a garage. And then somebody found him, because he used to do shairies and write poems and recite them. And somebody said, go, go in the film industry. And then when he went to Bimal Roy, he recognized, uh, of course, he wrote the lyrics first. First, Bimal Roy didn't, didn't believe that he was going to be anybody. And then he became a very well-known lyricist and his pehchan, the real pehchan of Gulzar was poet. So what is your real pehchan? The, is the pehchan that you are a mechanic or a coolie or a farmer or is it something that you do creatively as an individual we have not learned our 
the innate creativity of human beings is skilled in the school system. I think everybody agrees with that. So there are two things that are necessary as we go up and grow up and say, education is going to help me live a better life. Okay, improve my life. And, and, and improve my life is not only by getting a job, but I must get a better life. Does the education system today help me? First of all, as I said, jobs, there's a limited number of jobs, right? And then if I say a better life, so does the education system or the education help me live a better life? Let's ask that question. Even today, physical education, dealing with mental stress, all those things that affect your life, being happy, nothing of that sort is dealt with in the current education system. The education system today says come into a course, pass the exam and finish off. And as, as uh, uh, I think our uh, MC's name is Sonali, as she was reading, I think she was quoting from my abstract, is that, and, and in this process of so-called education, which doesn't help you learn to live a better life. It doesn't recognize who you are. It doesn't recognize how many marks you got and what certificate you got. Right? So, for example, somebody, I, I remember in my class, in, in, in my school uh, at Khar, there was a young man who used to sit down on the last bench, well, not quite the last bench, he was a little short, and draw cartoons and comics. And uh, during the day, during the school day, he used to come up with a hand hand drawn comic book for everybody to read. That art of his was never recognized. The teacher found him drawing, he would be punished severely. He shouldn't have done that. But then there was nothing in the education system to recognize that he was such a fantastic uh, cartoonist. But later on, he became a doctor. That's a different thing. Uh, and I did not, mind you. So, uh, for different kind. So, um, I think the education system, everybody knows the education system today is straight jacketed and it says this, this, this. But the, the problem is the system is a reflection of who we are. Or it's, 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 a, it's a relationship together. Um, I don't know how much time I have now. I've spent half an hour. So now the question is, what kind of a education system do we really need? What kind of an education system? What the system does today is from the beginning, from preschool interviews, which preschool will you go to, which kindergarten will you go to, will you get an admission? You go higher, higher, higher. And along the way, there are filters. You, you, you have to pass so many examinations, then you go higher. Then you have to fight for admission. I was shocked in, in, in the colleges, 99%. I taught in a college where the cutoff point way back in uh, 1990s used to be 99% uh, and more. What is that? I mean, on some examination, you're getting 99% is fine, but what is this? What kind of a competition is this? In at a time, and, and, and times have changed completely. Once upon a time, getting knowledge and skills was so very difficult. In fact, when the school started in a village, the only, well, the educated person, the knowledgeable person in the village would be the teacher. Can you say that about uh, people uh, as a teacher today? Whether it is a faculty in the university, or it is a, a, a school teacher in a village, you can't say he or she is the highest, most educated, most knowledgeable, most skilled person in his community. You can't say that anymore. If I want to learn something, why do I have to go to so-called so-called reputed university and a building of a university? 
when knowledge is available so freely and can be made so much more freely. The problem is this, there's, a, <laughs> there's a economics. If you say that knowledge will be freely available, then somebody is going to provide it. Let's take an example. If I say that uh, you, uh, and, and, and let's talk about SPJ Institute, and I can claim some right on this institution as a, as a great admirer of Manish Bhai. Then suppose SPJ says, okay, here are our courses and here are our notes and whatever, and we will only hold examinations of students every quarter on various subjects. If you do well, we will give the certificate from SPJ. Why is this not possible? The process it's not possible because if you do that, uh, okay, then people will pay for the examination, not for the classes. Okay, but can it be free of cost? Well, it it should be. Why not? It can be free of cost. I think instead of com students competing for admission to SPJ Institute, it could be competing for uh, not even competing. As I said. Or every quarter examination and it could be it could be an examination that is uh, virtual like you know and then we've got you gotten used to the idea of uh, lectures and webinars and so on and so forth so it can be done virtually it doesn't have to be face to face and so on and so forth so there are interesting ways of removing the barriers the question is can it be done and will it be respected wow well, what you what spj and institute can do can be done by many colleges. Anybody can start a, 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 an examination system. You're not well. Anybody in his whatever. So, for example, if you have to go abroad, you've got to give your GMATs and so on. And those examinations are recognized by universities. They can. They may be recognized by uh, uh, by companies, corporates. Why not? The question is when who somebody has to recognize that you have learned something. How do you how did you learn the skill? I'll give you another example, a very low level example, not quite at the management level. We, the organization, run vocational training programs. Now, once upon a time, vocational training programs were given by uh, given by the government through ITIs as they are known, Industrial Technical uh, Institutes. And that was the only chapa, the Sarkari chapa was the only recognized chapa. But now with so many skilled people required, when you run the vocational training program, we really don't need it. We are a, a small example of what SP Jain Institute is or what managed by created. We don't really need a recognition. I run the course. And then the skilled person I take to the corporates and say, do you what do you want to employ? We take them to hotels, we take them to industry, business, uh, our auto mechanics go work in uh, mechanic shops. And for that, you don't, I have not gone and asked for a recognition. All we say is we are doing these, these, these courses, this person is working. Now they are also interviewed uh, online by prospect to employers and employed. Learning of skills has become that much more free of barriers. Now, this can be possible. And, and, and one example I can give you is Google is saying that if you pass our examinations, then you don't need to show me a degree. You know that. And if that is the case now, we could turn it around completely. And, and, and I know I'm mixing up jobs and skills and so on and so forth. But to make education barrier free, I think it should be uh, it should be possible to say the monopoly of giving this education and passing on education and that giving of education monopoly is based on the chappa on the certification. Uh, uh, you can you can uh, see how how that can be changed. I give you an example of Google, but there are other things. For example, other software in industries, uh, corporates or companies uh, hire you, hire young people, 
and then they uh, spent two years training them in many many uh, companies also you spend two years anyway learning on the job you can say that the country this country largely learns on the jobs people complain that you know care young people who come to the companies and give you give them jobs they really they have not really really learned anything from colleges and schools so we have to retrain them or retrain them all, all over again but the fact of the matter is that the large numbers of people most people learn on the jobs because it's not possible to give somebody knowledge and skills completely totally as required in their work workplace uh, of course, there are exceptions, and I accept that there are exceptions. You can't create a surgeon by taking courses online and so on. A skilled surgeon or even a skilled machinist must work with his hands. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grant those exceptions. But, but companies can say that we will give our own certificates. Why is that not possible? Why, why should a university only give certificates? Large numbers of courses can be certified by companies because that's where the knowledge is. The most of the knowledge is actually being used in companies and so on. Uh, when you are not employed by companies, also somebody can say, "I I, I know this person and uh, such and such person has acquired a certain number of skills." So it is possible to make education barrier free. Us, whether it is uh, and, and this whole concept of degrees and all that can melt away. I am look. I am sounding a little too optimist, uh, optimistic in my old age, I suppose. Uh, but this is all this I see as possibility. I wanted to uh, innovate, and I might still do that. Uh, a machine I call ATM. The ATM that you thinking of is not the one it's called the anytime testing machine anytime testing machine imagine like the atm kiosk that you have around the corner of your house or your institution so you take a card a plastic card stick it in and and all this technology is available today all technology is available today and the machine asks you batao teri raza kya hai so what would you want to be uh, tested on? And I say English. Okay. Choose your level. One, two, three, four, five, six. And choose whether you want a written exam or an oral exam. Spoken English. I say spoken English level two. And he says, okay. Good morning. How are you? And then I have a conversation with the machine. This is entirely possible. If anybody wants to be an entrepreneur on this and try it out, I think it is doable. I'm sure a number of people in the audience are saying that this is doable. Of course, this is in some cases, you can do this for science, you can do this for history, geography, whatever. It's just a matter of getting the content together and saying, ask the right question. Then, If this is done, do I really need to go to school? I'll end now by telling you something funny 2010 12 in that period i first started asking myself you know we are struggling so hard to get the children to learn to read but they, the schools are not doing that we can do it in in, in less than 30 days uh, outside uh, well 50 days uh, outside the school by holding learning camps something that can be done in 50 days people are taking years and not able to do why do you need to go to school so my organization's uh, motto is is still is every child in school and learning well and in a meeting a similar kind of a seminar but it was all face to face with the staff of uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, staff of Intel at Jaipur, I asked, first time I asked this question, hmm, why can't we change the motto to every child not in school and learning? And people were shocked. How can this be? And this is my uh, answer. You can actually organize learning. I have not fully talked about the kind of schooling 
Homeschooling is well known. A lot of people do homeschooling. If you want to say that if, if somebody, if you can recognize teachers, uh, today you can be a teacher only in a school institution, but look at the number of coaching classes there are. Look what happened during the pandemic. If you look at it that way, then there could be neighborhood schools of high order. Imagine. And there are so many people who can be facilitators, mentors. You don't need to be a teacher of the same kind that 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 have been there for the last 200 years. I, I don't know whether I said it right or not. The whole schooling institution, the educational institutions, I think their time is up. Making a very strong statement. I was talking to uh, Mr. Nandan Nilekani uh, two years ago, and we agreed that the education institutions of today, I mean, of course, there were universities, Cambridge, Oxford, before that, Nalanda and all that. Those were institutions not of mass, mass learning, but institutions of mass learning came up in the last 200 years after schools were set up. Then, uh, now, those institutions with walls, their time is up. Now you have to create new institutions with no walls, with no barriers, and then create new laws, rules, and procedures. Now, what are those laws, rules, and procedures? They will emerge out of the practice of today. As I said, Google has started something. Software industry does something. I know industries, forging industries, where they take large numbers of engineers and train a few work with the machines and so on and so forth so there's a lot out there happening and out of this practice of today the institutions of learning tomorrow and institutions of certification for tomorrow will emerge but they will all be pointing towards a barrier free education i have spoken a lot i think i should stop now thank you hello I don't know whether I was talking to myself. No, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for your very stimulating lecture. Uh, the forum is now open for a couple of questions, please. I was looking at my watch. This this thing is supposed to last till one thirty. Right? Okay, so I have not really gone over the limit. No, okay. Ask a question. Are you following any particular order for questions? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, anybody who has any doubt can uh, can put up their hands and we'll go forward. Okay. May I go forward? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, who's the you... moderator? Who's the who's the so Sonal has the uh, right to decide who asks the question. Yes, no, sir, Shruti has. Right, I take over right now. Sir. I don't see Shruti. Where is Shruti? Oh, okay, there. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah okay, fine. Okay. Uh, anybody with anything, any question can please go ahead. Thank you very much. So, my question is one from the field. So, I run uh, the Abhyudhya Initiative at uh, SPGIMR, and uh, we teach, uh, we have a group of uh, students from neighboring slums. Uh, we call Sitaras and uh, Muted? No, okay. So uh, um, we teach them. And of course, the pandemic has been an enormous struggle because we've not been able to um, bring them to camp. And we have shifted yeah. to computer based education. And we are trying to get laptops for all of our children. We have succeeded to a large extent. I am at a crossroads of now that I have got these computers where do I go with these kids they come with very low uh, language skills computer skills uh, math and science skills children from at grade seven have the skills of grade two I seek your advice yeah <clears throat> yeah so so where do you go now that is a question that yes. is my question too that, that the system doesn't know the system the system doesn't have an answer to that so if you uh, i'll tell you we started a program 
called the second chance. So uh, uh, young people can, especially women, I mean, it started for women, but you can do this for the, the children also by working with NIOS, National Institute for Open Schooling. Uh, you can prepare them to pass their 10th standard. If strictly, if you want to stay within the current system, okay? That is possible. The other possibility is to then say, oh, okay, that I think would be the advisable thing to do because with 10 standard, many other doors in the current system open up. I can dream a lot about barrier free this and the other, but one barrier is 10 standard. And if you can do it with NIOS, it's an open school. So fewer barriers, I suppose, if you do that, then that's a good possibility. And it doesn't matter as long as they are of a certain age, they can appear for that exam. If they don't uh, have to show any school certificate or what, I suspect. But that's a that's a simple one. But at the same time, I would really strongly encourage you to look at what other skills these kids have while you do the national open. And in the national open school, incidentally, you can take courses of arts and uh, singing, music, and so on and so forth. So you take a look at that. And if these kids have those skills, uh, because now, you, you know, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, I was told, why are you playing all the time? Khel, khel ke kisi ka ped hai kya? Or not I, but my friends were told. And look now, you play kabaddi and you can be in the kabaddi league. So jobs are, you know, work is not the same thing as job. And people are uh, opening up opening up opportunities for themselves doing different things. And uh, if you are going to have, you do have an abuse uh, program. Uh, the biggest thing people need is help in marketing. A good artist, a child artist, a group of kids doing those things uh, will benefit from uh, somebody helping them with the marketing. Anyway. So I think there is a lot is, that is possible. It, the question is how much, <clears throat> I'm sure you have the energy and the enthusiasm, but how much time you have uh, you to do this. Thank you. So we have a question on the chat from Mr. Sudhir. Uh, Mr. Sudhir, would you like to post it uh, directly or may I please go ahead and read it? Yeah, am I, am I, which one, what, what is the question? Uh, the question is, what can NEP do to close online device gap that is very wide? Um, what, uh, the example, I'll give you an example. For small groups, we are running a very large scale program in about 1000 villages, in which we've done, we have, we have set up what we call the digital device library. So in every village, uh, there are groups of five or six in these 1000 villages, we have formed uh, groups of uh, five, six children. And each group uh, is supported by a local youth who may have completed 10 standard, 12 standard and so on. Uh, and that person is given a tablet, which is circulated among those five, six children. Okay. So uh, it's with them. And they can use it anytime they want. Now the problem is connectivity. So we have also, in addition, given a dongle. Uh, and we are adding to that now a Raspberry Pi uh, computer uh, in which, which acts as a repository. So you don't have to connect all the time, even if the connectivity is not there. And this whole setup, so each, each tablet is about a hundred dollars. The, the repository is another couple of hundred dollars and the dongle is 2,000, 3,000 rupees. So if you take $700 plus whatever, 700 is what? 30,000 rupees, thereabouts. So uh, you can, for, for a village, for about 40, 50,000 rupees, you can actually create a digital device library that works. Okay. Uh, now, it's, this similar thing is possible in in environments in places where connectivity is high uh, and uh, now we know our asar survey 
latest one showed that uh, after the second wave not right now 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 even better now after the second wave of the pandemic uh, the proportion of rural population that had uh, smartphones jumped from 36% two years before that 2018 it was 36% and it jumped to 63% so the proportion of people who have smartphones and the connectivity is increasing okay so so you don't necessarily have to uh, give these tablets to all i think this is a transient problem this problem is going to uh, not remain at the same level over the next few years but i think digital device library is is a, is a, is going to be a solution for the next, I would say about 10 years or so. And creating these libraries is possible. And the cost can be lower or a little higher depending upon where you are. Uh, and, and when I said five tablets, when I calculated, I said five tablets, that is for a whole village, okay? So about 40 to 50 children or 30 to 40 children. And that's, that's is the possibility. Did I answer that question? Yes, sir, very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir, I we wish have... I could see the face of the person who's asking the question. Is it possible? Um, okay, the no. The question was posed by uh, Mr. Sudhir, but I am not sure where he is right now, sir. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we have another question on chat by Mr. Anirvan. Uh, a lot of people take time off from work and education to prepare for exams like UPSC, CAT, etc. How would you see this in light of the potential income lost and effect of GDP per capita? Ooh, I don't have an answer to that question. <laughs> um, I, 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 I can only say that there's a, there's a feeling out there, and, and I see this in among young people who are unemployed also, that yeah, UPSC, the state uh, examinations have to be uh, done and competitive exams, that's what's going to get you jobs, but they don't realize how few the jobs are. So I don't know, uh, people still, it's it's a madness out there that you need to get into UPSC and government jobs and so on. Uh, that is still there, but I don't, I don't know what the income loss or whatever is. I can't answer that question. Got it, sir. Um, one more. Uh, many small companies hesitate for, from hiring fresh graduates because of a lot of investment involved in training, and still there is a fear of people leaving the job after that. In such a situation, how can we motivate companies to invest in training youth? Uh, I think the, the, this is something Manish Sabarwal also talked about a lot, that the government has to encourage apprenticeship. So if you say... And, and, and we say that I mean, uh, we are spending, let's say, in vocational training that we do, uh, when the vocational training was held uh, in residential places, our rough cost of each uh, cost per trainee uh, was uh, about 20,000 rupees, right? And, and it lasted about three months of training. And so we requested different companies saying, we'll identify a young person, prepare him uh, to come to your doorstep with a with an attitude that I want to work and all preparation, etc. And you give them apprenticeship on the job training for the next three months, and then select if you want that person for a job. I think this is something that many companies can do now. Uh, there are there are smaller companies which are complaining that look my profit margin is so small that i can't afford to do this so it's possible for example like manrega right if you if you have the uh, and manrega is for unskilled work but for every every young person who's uh, completing the age of uh, 18 if you can give a 10000 rupee grant it's a direct cash transfer now, will this work from a total economic point of view? I think it will work. So 10,000 rupees. So if you're not going to any college or school, or if you want to go work, 
then there is 10,000 rupees month available for you uh, to go for X number of months. And you take that money with you and you work and you get trained and you get a job. Now, I know this has been done in some cases before and it doesn't work. There's corruption, there's all that. Well, this is, this is something that you have to fight everywhere. But that is the answer. If you can do that as a direct cash transfer to the person himself, who goes to a company saying, I'm an apprentice, I have the money, you give me a job. Uh, it's probably possible and, and it will require um, work done very sincerely and honestly. That is a big, big problem in our country. But it can be done. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Rupal Sharma has a question. Maybe please have her on spotlight, please. Uh, thank you, Shruti. Um, uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk, uh, Mr. Chauhan. And my question is really related to the work which you have been doing uh, for so many years. In terms of impact on the families of these children who had benefit of you know, the uh, educational support which has been extended to them, what has been the impact that you have seen part A? And part B, do you also see a network effect of these children who have benefited uh, further uh, being motivated to do the same uh, in their circle. No, okay. can you repeat the second part of the question? Please? The second part is that the children who have benefited from the ed educational support they have got, have they played a role further in their lives uh, by reaching out to others in their circle? Uh, I wish we had measured the impact uh, over the years. And... We keep saying that we've worked on such a large scale that measuring the, this impact on a full scale is very difficult. And as a result, we've not done it on the small scale also. So if you have not looked at, uh, after working with millions of children, what happened to them? Uh, we have not done that. Uh, but anecdotally, I can tell you uh, that these children, uh, uh, we measured some time back uh, the dropping out in the communities uh, reduced where we had worked. Reduced meaning went down to zero. If you work with children in the younger age, get them interested in basic learning and so on. And then if they have the confidence that I know, then the dropping out is, is much less. Uh, so we know that we have not, I can't give you exact numbers on it. Okay. Uh, the other thing I know is this second chance program that I was talking about. Every year, about three and a half thousand uh, dropout young women appear for this exam. That is there. The uh, 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 impact is very, very clear uh, because it's national uh, open school. Unfortunately, uh, in the open school or uh, 10th standard exam nowadays, even if you make a little effort, you pass. So everybody passes. So that is not an indication of quality. But it's a huge encouragement when an illiterate dropout young woman uh, appears for this exam, prepares and appears for this exam. And most of the time she's married, uh, husband, in-laws, everybody actually forms a support structure. That's, that's, I must tell you, there's no opposition to this. Everybody wants that bahu of the house or the daughter of the house to actually learn further. And then the level of confidence that grows is tremendous. And I, I know uh, from our numbers now that 33% of those who complete this 10th standard through uh, the second chance program uh, go on to do higher education also. So they actually go further into the college stream. Now, does the, again, I'm questioning whether that constitutes learning or not, but for personally for them, it's a huge achievement because they've gone further in life. I'm not saying uh, they are better than X or whatever, but for themselves, they, it's, a, it's a great achievement. And the sense of confidence that, that comes after that is tremendous. And that is more or less universal. That's very heartening to know. Thank you. And, in, and, and among, uh, we have a program now. We are working, so we have 100 vocational training centers. And each vocational training center uh, we have said there is a catchment area of 200 villages. So there are 20,000 villages that we can reach through that program. And there are others that we do. And in each village, there are people who are 
participate in the vocational training programs at different levels. And now we've instituted a program we call Education for Education. So that we tell these young people that we are going to give you vocational training free of, free of cost. But you must, in return, give something back to the society right there in your village. And what you do is you teach young children in the villages to read and to do basic arithmetic. I'll help you how to do that. You can do other things also. So it's so the young young people are being taught. Young people are being taught, and in return, they act as instructors, local instructors. This is making the system much more much more accessible to to the children in the villages. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. We have one question on chat right now. Um, Many companies are moving towards a hub and spoke office model with officers in Tier 3 uh, and smaller towns like Zoho Corp. What changes can be made in the rural education system in order to get the children and local youth ready to gain from such opportunities? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, learning, le excuse me, uh, I thought I'd put it on silent. Um, so, uh, if they are working in hub and spoke, so there are two things. The hub and spoke model that companies are following is one thing. Uh, and this hub and spoke model from urban areas moving to rural areas is another thing. But it should be, if the companies decide to move, then the question of how to change the education system arises, right? Otherwise, the system continues as it is. Suppose if now a company says, okay, we are going to set up uh, or make it possible for some people to work as coders uh, in villages also. And I'll train some young entrepreneur to become a coder or get a team of people to work as coders. Then the education system changes dramatically. We don't have to make any changes because then what happens is some young entrepreneur says, okay, I'm a coding entrepreneur. I need 10 people to work with me. I'll get the contract from company and I'll give it to you and, and you can do it. So education system change. I, I don't think education systems will change by themselves. What will change is how, how our business works. So today, if the hub and spoke model moves to rural areas or even, even the un underprivileged communities, I think it is possible because I believe, I, I thought, and I must admit my failure in this, I used to think until a year or two ago, a year ago, uh, not even a year ago, six months ago, <laughs> that uh, the underprivileged young people uh, are hugely challenged by lack of opportunities and, and they are not digitally aware or they are not digitally literate. They may be using the cell phones and all that, but not really digital. But recently, uh, uh, during the pandemic, we ran this course for digital awareness. And the, and the feedback that I got from the field, which surprised me, I shouldn't have been surprised, should believe in the young people, I was young once, uh, that uh, people know so much more about, about how to use their cell phones. They said the worry is that we don't know how to be safe. They don't know how, but otherwise, they know how to use the various apps and social media and so on and so forth. So that they've mastered. So if you know that, then you can go very high and very far. Very far. So um, um, the answer to that question is that, look, people already know. See, what we learn in the schools is very little these days. <laughs> What you learn outside the school or what you could possibly learn outside the school is huge. And young people are learning that. So while I say, you know, they are not reading up to the standard, in the villages, I find so many kids with their YouTube channels. Where are they learning this? Because all this is self-learning. This is happening. This is happening. Yeah. So the company should decide, okay, let me promote this hub and spoke model. Uh, for village youth and see what happens. It might work. Not not at the higher order, maybe at the lower order. It should work. 
Thank you, sir. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chavan. Thank you so much uh, for your very interesting, informative session that we had. I have a question. Uh, we always feel that municipal schools don't have the quality. They don't have the teachers who are trained. They don't have an environment where the children can really learn and it can be affordable. But suppose if we really strengthen these schools, municipal schools with trained teachers, quality education, and also make it accessible. You think parents would still send their children to municipal school because there's a mindset that if a child goes to municipal school, he perhaps may not learn what he would learn in private school. So how do you remove this kind of a barrier which is in the parents' mind or even people who think that municipal schools are always bad, but there are people who have really done very well even in the municipal schools. So how do you make it more inclusive and how do you, you know, kind of make this widen gap into a lesson gap? Uh, I think inclusive, inclusive is very difficult to do. Okay. I mean, the society is not inclusive. If the society was to become inclusive, okay. you know, you live in Mumbai, I have lived in Mumbai. In the old days, the, the, a, a Mumbai, and especially in Mumbai, Delhi is not, this is not the case. In Mumbai, there used to be a continuum of the poorest and the richest. Wherever you go, there were slums and of the poorest and, and the richest nearby, and there was a synergy in, in that living. Uh, uh, and, and, and children went to municipal schools, uh, private schools, and the private school, municipal school difference was not very high. Now, like the gated communities that we've created everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 in, in the schools also, these are clubs. There are the highest air conditioned schools where even some upper middle class people can't send their children. So there are clubs everywhere. There's, there's a segregation of the highest order. So many people, so, so many children are victims of this segregation, of these barriers. The municipal school children cannot go to the aided school. The aided school children can't go to the private school and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, we know from all our work that we've done that the quality of learning is not so much dependent on the school but on the parents okay if the parent has higher income put, put in the private school so the private school itself doesn't really contribute in fact our data shows that if you control in for the education and the income of the parent the learning levels of children in government schools and private schools are the same. Okay. So it it is it is not as though the school is contributing or not contributing. They are both equally inefficient. What happens is the parents are the difference. So <coughs> now that that is that is not helpful because if if the municipal school children and and the government school children and their parents are not well equipped then clearly we must do something to help the, the parents exactly so, exactly that's my back, I, I intend to go back to my adult education days where parents are given assistance and say okay get this done do this help it mm -hmm. this is what happened during the pandemic when so-called online became popular it was not quite online but clearly parents were sitting with the children and saying if the school is closed do something learn something and we and many other NGOs started giving material to parents to help them out. Not that the parents were a, were a great help in learning, but the fact is that the parents replaced the school in a sense, and they started getting something done. There is a huge learning loss from what we have seen now in data, uh, data comparative data, two years the comparison between uh, uh, learning then and learning now after the pandemic. Uh, in Karnataka and Chhattisgarh, and we find that there's a huge learning loss among children because the discipline of the school has gone, or the you know the homework, whatever that has gone down. Uh, but but parents can actually replace, and if we do that, if we strengthen the parents' yeah, contribution yeah. to the children, connection between the school and the home, if we encourage, then I think we can probably address the problem of education much more easily than what you're saying you know train people because 
that people no. have tried and it didn't it didn't work. work. No, but Delhi model, you think, is possible over here to replicate the Delhi school municipal school model? Is it possible to replicate such a model in urban areas like Mumbai and other cities? No, no, you... not the Delhi school municipal school model is completely. I don't think it works. Learning levels are very bad in municipal schools. What you're talking about, Delhi government schools are yeah. saying, ah. and they are claiming they are claiming that their learning levels have increased. We don't know that that is actually true. So everybody makes claims. The Delhi government schools are looking much nicer. Yeah, okay. they're looking much nicer. There's a, there's a difference between the Delhi government schools and the Delhi MCD schools. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. But yeah, you are right. I mean, MCD schools, the lot. I mean, the Delhi schools, government schools model or whatever they are trying to do. Yeah. Okay. At least you can see that they are focused on doing something. Whether learning right. levels have improved and it remains to be seen. And that's largely from sixth grade onwards. Okay. The MCD schools are up to fifth standard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Yeah. Uh, Nilesh, please go to, please do go ahead. Uh, so I had this question that when we see technology as a catalyst to the education system. Uh, but this too has some uh, demerits along with, uh, along with, as in when the technology comes with a lot of distractions and uh, the use of technology at an early age can lead the students into the trap of glamour and multimedia and the entertainment industry that uh, is associated with the internet. Uh, how do you think the education system today or uh, the one that we designed for future can address to this particular problem? And uh, also, since the COVID pandemic has uh, really uh, kind of shifted uh, everyone to the online mode very quickly. Uh, do you think that this uh, is a major problem today for the youth? So, first of all, um, I do not believe uh, that just giving a digital device with a lot of content and access to the internet is going to lead to or does lead to any learning. Uh, that doesn't work. No, the learning is a different kind of learning is possible. Okay, but not your academic schoolies kind of learning. That is not, that requires focus and motivation. If the child is motivated somehow to learn uh, 10 standard mathematics, then the child will learn. Okay, but if you have not motivated and you need assistance of a grown up, focused and grown up assistance, those two things are required and the motivation. If you don't have those, then the digital device is just bringing the stuff to you. You can't get it. Okay, so that is important. But the interesting thing, as I said, is that the children learn regardless. You know, we, I give you my our example, I started experimenting with digital devices uh, some five, six years ago. And we said in the school, in, in the villages, let's try to give tablets, like I gave that example of digital device libraries give tablets to a group one tablet to a group of five six kids and just give it let's see what happens with some uh, what do you call apps and so on and so forth and we did not instruct nothing and we said just this is five six years ago and my colleague said let's put a password in the, in the tablet so that uh, you know they won't import these kinds of distractions into the tablet so no other game comes in and so on. I said, okay, let's do that. And we did that. And we gave something like 3000 tablets in three states, UP, Rajasthan and Maharashtra, uh, four districts, three, 400 villages, some 3000 tablets we gave. And lo and behold, within 15 days, 15 days, I started getting reports that, and we did a, uh, survey and we knew we came to know that 50 percent of the tablets the password was broken and the children were telling our people uh, our supervisors so to say abhi hum aapko, uh, password nahi dene wale, password abhi now the, how did they how did they learn this so so some kids our people were wondering how how did this happen i said imagine this first that the remaining 50% tab tablets have the same password. How is that possible? 
why did it stop at 5% was my question, but 50%. So kids learned completely different things. We were giving them apps and so on. What we found is the kids were making videos of their own. Now, where in schools do they teach how to make videos? So we started running workshops for making videos. We gave them apps to edit videos. They started learning that. We started giving them, uh, uh, what is that called? Um, uh, the, the course for uh, writing scripts for videos. So learning took a completely different turn. We said it doesn't. What what about science? So you want to teach science? What do we? What did we do? We one of our uh, young people went to the village and said, "Arey, I am a village girl. 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 And she was always pretending कि ये कैसे पता चलता है आपको क्या आम है वो तो ये पत्ता देखो ना पत्ता देख के पता चलता है कि क्या है पेड़ ऐसा होता है इसके ना all that is botany of a higher order which the kids knew then we asked other kids from other villages to say okay आप लोग क्यों ऐसे वीडियो नहीं बनाए तो we got thousands of videos like that because every group wanted to make a video locally so they were creating their own content now that's a different way of learning altogether than I tell you and you learn. Okay, so this was a different flow. So uh, I don't I don't remember now why why I got into this. Your question was so. What was the question? <laughs> so that uh, does the demerits of the technology today? Uh, yeah, uh, so, so, so are a problem today. Yes. So so I think. There is that you have to encourage children to learn and then redefine. Why do I want them to learn this kind of mathematics that I'm teaching? And out of this, the child gets motivated to learn. First, the motivation to learn when it is there, they can start uh, uh, learning quickly. It doesn't take time. What is there to learn? It's a piece of cake, all this education. Okay. Yes. Thank so, you. so, the, so, just the, the, the main point is just by giving a device and the internet access, that is not going to happen. And and you don't and, and then I teach you learn that doesn't work. You let the children learn, and then see how it works. Yes, thank you. Sir. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we will take a stop on the questions asked. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for clarifying all the questions that were posed by the attendees. Uh, Dr. Chavan has raised some fundamental questions that will stay with us for a very long time. Uh, before we conclude the program, I would like to share a quote by Dr. Shrikant. I believe it resonates very strongly with our conversation today and the management education that SPJIMR focuses on. It goes as, as far as management education is concerned, the concept of manan, that is reflection, is at the center of the educational scheme of things. Concentration, which is at the center for such skills, can be developed through practices of yoga or meditation. Similarly, the other aspect of the centrality of management education is the quality of desire, which must reflect the tendency to take on responsibility, self-confidence and self-conviction. Students should be in the constant habit of searching for opportunities for learning and thus recognize one's own responsibility to be a teacher to oneself. Next, I would like to thank Dr. Varun Nagraj, Professor Malai Krishna, Dr. Neerja Mattu, Professor Abbasali Gabula, Professor Jagdish Ratnani, and Professor Surya Tahora for helping us organize this memorial lecture, along with all the faculty members and staff of SVJIMR. I extend my sincere gratitude to our emeritus faculty, Dr. Neerja Mattu, Professor Rakaya Joshi, Dr. Keith D'Souza, Professor Oscar J. D'Souza, Professor Advani, Professor Jairam, and Dr. K.G. Karmakar, who have taken their time out to grace us with their presence today. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all our alumni and our SPJIMR participants for being a very wonderful audience. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Can I leave now? Sure, sure.